Jars of large snakes on a shelf. A woman carries a case. Someone picks up spider specimen. A presenter stands in a hallway in the museum. 2024 has been another incredible year for species described right here at the Natural History Museum, London. Our scientists have been involved in documenting and describing some 190 new species, each with their own narrative. It includes everything from bats and rats to crabs, bees, flatworms and diatoms. It's safe to say that they each have their own amazing story to tell. First up is a new species of clear wing moth some 7,000 kilometers from home. Now named Carmenta brachyclados, or Cadet's clear wing, let's hear from one of the scientists who helped describe this new species, Mark Sterling, about what makes the insect so special. Mark is in a room full of specimen trees. So this was a case where um, a clear wing moth caterpillars in a fragment of seed pod. A yellow and black moth with a clear wings. Got stuck to the boot of a professional photographer got carried in an aeroplane 4,500 miles to the UK uh, to a cold Welsh winter, left in a boot bag, somehow emerged and were found by someone with the interest and the diligence to preserve all the materials uh, absolutely beautifully. Daisy Cadet is a young professional ecologist who lives with her mum, Ashley, in Port Talbot, South Wales. One February afternoon, uh, Daisy saw a small insect flying at the inside of a window in the house. She took an image of it and put it on Instagram. It, it caused quite a stir. Uh, one of her father was very quickly said he thought it was something that's never been seen in the UK before. And after a bit of chatter, um, uh, put Daisy in touch with David and I at the museum. It belonged to a small group of clearwings from um, Central America and Northern Southern America. So I went back uh, uh, to Daisy and there was a bit of a silence. And she said, ah, mum, who's a professional photographer, um, uh, three months ago uh, came, uh, had a professional assignment in Guyana, and do you know what? Um, uh, in the living room, which is where I found the moth, is uh, uh, Ashley's boot bag, which is still unpacked from her trip to Guyana. I'm going to go and have a look at it. Well, about five minutes later, um, images appeared on my screen of um, two very delicate, beautiful, empty pupil cases. Um, which Daisy had found in the dried mud at the bottom of Ashley's boot bag, together with a tiny fragment of uh, plant material. Uh, we came to the conclusion that it wasn't a described species, that it was new to science, and so we have described this remarkable moth, which uh, we know is from central Guyana, but the only specimens and other materials known in the world are um, uh, from Port Talbot in South Wales. Uh, you know, how does a thing like this happen? Whilst Ashley was out in Guyana, she was told by local people that if she left an offering of tobacco to the jungle spirits, she would be shown something beautiful from the jungle. Well, the jungle spirits were clearly with Ashley so it must have been very good tobacco. The presenter stands between two columns in the museum. Who would have thought we'd find a new species of moth in South Wales, all the way from South America? But Cadet's clearwing wasn't the only new moth this year. Our scientists have described 11 new species of moth, in addition to 16 copepods, seven new amphipods from the deep sea, eight crabs, a handful of snails, a couple of praying mantids, and even a centipede from the Chagos, amongst a myriad of other invertebrate species described this year. But we're now gonna go down to the basement to meet Rupert Collins, one of our curators of fish. Rupert has a story about a new species of vegetarian piranha with a very special name. Rupert stands in a room full of middle tanks. So this year I helped describe a new species of vegetarian piranha, or piranha, called Myloplus sauron, named after Sauron from the Lord of the Rings. The reason we named this was a, really a no-brainer because this fish is sort of disc-shaped and has a sort of thin vertical bar across the body which looks just like an eye. 
the ancestors of the piranha was in fact vegetarian, so the meat-eating piranhas are really the exception rather than the norm, and really the whole group is mostly mostly vegetarian or omnivorous. And there's actually been quite a bit of research suggesting that even the meat-eating ones aren't strictly carnivorous at all and actually have a more varied diet than we actually actually used to believe. So a lot of the reputation that piranhas have is um, comes from the former US President Theodore Roosevelt, who was also an explorer and spent a lot of time in South America uh, exploring the region. He described them as the embodiment of evil ferocity, which is frankly a little over the top, but this is part of the reason where, where the myth came from. Um, in truth, they are dangerous. They have, they have caused injuries to people. That's usually when water levels in the dry season, water levels are low, food is scarce, or when they're defending nests. But generally, I mean, I've, I've swum with piranhas several times and they're, they're absolutely fine. So they're, they're not the, the, the ravenous, bloodthirsty um, creatures of the movies. So this species is only found in the Xingu River in, uh, in Brazil, which is a tributary of the Amazon. It's a really unique river because it's, it's crystal clear water and hundreds of kilometers of, of really unique rapid systems. So the, unfortunately, the future is not looking great for this fish because these, these rapid habitats were chosen um, as the site of the, the infamous Belamonte hydroelectric project, which is a huge hydroelectric dam project, which is part of the um, sort of push to industrialize the uh, Amazon basin. Potentially one of the reasons that it was that these dam projects were given the go-ahead was because you know the, the, the species diversity was grossly un underestimated and we didn't know how, how many endemic species were found there but since these projects have been launched we're finding that there's you know probably upwards of 70 endemic species just found in this very small region in the uh, in the Shinga River. Overall the biodiversity in this river is about 450 species maybe 500 um, in total and that's basically comparable to the number of species that live in Europe. So it's a hugely biodiverse region and describing species, putting names on them, knowing their distributions, knowing how they differ from other species is really important for conservation and for just understanding a natural world. The presenter stands on a balcony in the museum. I'm still not sure I would want to go swimming with them, but in addition to the piranha, Rupert has also been involved in describing three new species of Kandiru catfish, which have the rather unfortunate habit of swimming up people's genitals. In addition to this, there was a host of other vertebrates, including four new species of rats, four snakes, a number of frogs, Sicilians, and a new species of bat. Our scientists have also been involved in describing a number of fossil species. A new flying reptile from the Isle of Skye is helping to bridge a gap in our understanding of pterosaur evolution. Paul Barrett tells us more. Paul sits in an office surrounded by illustrations of dinosaur. So the new species we're talking about here is a type of flying reptile, an extinct animal called a pterosaur, which lived in Scotland about 160 million years ago. This new species we've named Cheoptera evansi, which reflects where we found it on the Isle of Skye, Keo being the old Gallic name for Skye, Terra meaning wing, which uh, refers to it being a flying reptile, and Evans Eye in honour of Professor Susan Evans, who's a world leading expert on extinct reptiles. We found the new pterosaur during an expedition to the Isle of Skye in Scotland in 2006, a small museum expedition with just three of us going up to have a look for fossils of middle Jurassic age. And while we were looking on the beach, we came across a large boulder with a few tiny bone fragments showing on the surface. And we decided this was something worth investigating, so we took out a chunk of rock where those bone fragments were and brought them back to the lab in the museum to try and find out more. Once we got it back, it took well over a year in the lab with specialist technicians using tools to reveal the bones and remove the rock. But even then, we couldn't see everything that we wanted to. So we also decided to use our CT scanner to peer inside the rock to give us a better idea of what the bones look like in three dimensions, and also to reveal bones that were still buried within the rock itself. And once we did that, we realized we had a partial skeleton of a flying reptile, which is really rare from rocks of this age, and in particular to have one this complete from this part of the world. So this particular pterosaur fills a gap in time. There are very few pterosaurs with complete skeletons or near complete skeletons from the middle Jurassic period. So even our partial skeleton helps to fill in some missing information from the fossil record. In addition, this particular group of pterosaurs is known largely from East Asia, from China. And so this is a range extinction to another part of the world where we didn't know that they'd exist before. So again, filling in some of the gaps in the fossil record of these very difficult to preserve fragile animals. 
Kyopter was living in a very mixed environment of what we think was a kind of estuary-like setting. So near the sea, but not quite at the sea, a well-watered floodplain, and there are lots of other animals and plants living alongside it that we've already excavated and discovered from the same site, and these included small turtles, these included large dinosaurs, and also many lizards and salamanders, and even some tiny mammals. So this is a medium-sized flying reptile with a wingspan of maybe two, three meters. Uh, it would have had, as far as we know, a fairly long neck, slender head, very long elongate wings. It would have looked very much like the kinds of flying reptiles you're familiar with from Jurassic Park and other similar movies. The presenter stands in front of a large well skeleton. As if a new British pterosaur wasn't exciting enough, our scientists have also been involved in describing a new species of dinosaur from the Isle of Wight. Paul was also involved in describing another new species of dinosaur, this time from Zimbabwe, from rocks dating to around 250 million years old. He's also included a species of lungfish from the same formation. These join uh, an exciting 50 new species of fossil bryozoans, or moss animals, a new fossil fungus, seed ferns, wasp, and even a fossil poop. Maybe the less said about that one. This is just a snapshot of the amazing diversity of new species described by hundreds of museum scientists over the last 12 months. What they'll find over the next, who knows? I guess we'll just have to wait to find out. Film credit appears on screen over the presenter.